Okay. So everybody's back from coffee, I guess, and we continue with the last talk of the morning session that will be given by Bram Verbeek from uh, Uppsala University or Universität. <laughs> and uh, it's on single, single valued and modular iterated Eisenstein integrals in string theory. Please. Yeah, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me more or less? Mike on well? Okay. Not great or? I can, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, right. So, yeah, thank you very much for having me at this wonderful workshop. Um, oh, there we go. That's uh, now I'm amplified. So, uh, I will be talking about single value the modular iterated Eisenstein integrals in string theory. Um, in particular, I'll be I'll be talking about these two papers. One of which um, came out in the end of 2020. And the other is hopefully coming out soon. Um, oops. Oh. Uh, I uh, put 220 something uh, to not stress my collaborators out too much to commit to this month. But let's say that we're, uh, we're hoping for a, um, a near horizon on this uh, publication. And uh, this is work that was done in collaboration with this uh, wonderful set of people, many who, whose names you will recognize and are here in the audience uh, in two different constellations. Um, it's great that many of them are here, both for you, because then if you have any questions, you have many people to talk to, and also for me, because then if I get a question, I can always phone a friend from the audience. All right. Let's see. This isn't... So I'll just move from here. Or... Oh, there we go. Yeah. So um, this, as I said, this talk is based on essentially two different papers. Um, and so I will more or less try to cut the talk in half, um, but really there, there are two papers that work around one central concept and there are two different approaches to the same question. I mean, they, they, ha they, they relate to this question of um, the single light map and how it interacts with string integrals. Um, and in the first part of my talk, I will really be doing a string integral first approach looking from the string theory uh, down onto uh, what this implies to the mathematical functions that arise. And then the second part, I'll really be, be doing more of a math first approach or focusing more on the functions first. All right, but let me start with a little bit of introduction. Okay, so this slide is um, basically uh, not necessary for this audience, but let me just review it real quick. So we're dealing with string perturbation theory. So we want to expand in the string coupling. Uh, and this talk will also expand in the inverse string tension alpha prime, which means that we're looking at low energy and weak coupling. We're working in a 10D Minkowski background. Basically, the moral of this slide is we're looking at uh, the vanilla, the most vanilla string theory we can think of, uh, just kind of not even really working with the physics, but just using it as a mathematical laboratory to generate some certain integrals that we're interested in and seeing what kind of transcendental objects appear when we uh, try and solve them. Um, all right, so time for some cartoons. If we do this expansion in G string, it's the same as an expansion in the genus of the world sheets for the open string uh, four particles. It looks like this with closed string. It would look like this. Uh, now these geometries, uh, although they're nice to look at, don't look very uh, tractable. But luckily we have some conformal symmetry so we can map the external states to punctures on the world sheet at tree level. That means for instance, that this um, uh, open string diagram turns into a disc with punctures on the boundary. And for the closed string, we get a sphere with punctures. And so essentially we can uh, map all of these different contributions down to their like token geometries. Uh, and in particular in this talk, we're going to be restricting ourselves to genus zero and genus one. And we're gonna leave the modular parameter unintegrated, um, which essentially means that we won't, um, we won't integrate out any of the parameters that control the geometry of these, um, yeah, of these configuration spaces. And so these are really the four uh, configuration spaces that we care about the disk and the sphere, and the cylinder and the torus. Now, you could wonder, okay, what kind of integrals are we interested in? Uh, I will consider generic string integrals, uh, which is a very vague way of putting it, but it's, it's uh, enough of a cartoon for what I want to communicate. So a string integral is uh, integral over some configuration space that I should just showed you, uh, times the Koba-Nielsen factor, which is, some, uh, is the exponential of the Green's function multiplying this model sum, and it captures the alpha prime dependence, so this object will expand in the low energy limit times a logarithmic form. And this is also a bit of a vague statement, but what I mean by that is 
essentially um, at genus zero you get d log of the difference between two puncture positions at genus one you could get for instance a d log of jacobi theta function the idea is really you you insert some form here um which is in some sense uh, you know these string integrals should be the result of um, doing computation, throwing away a lot of the physical information, and really only caring about the transcendental bits. So you can think of these kind of as stringy analogs to, let's say, um, scalar master integrals if you're doing some kind of gauge theory computation. They're just kind of like token objects that are transcendental. All right. If we do this alpha prime expansion, these integrals evaluate to, um, for the open string at tree level, multiple zeta values, and for the closed string, single value, multiple zeta values. Now, of course, I'm uh, talking to a very expert audience, so I, I shouldn't uh, uh, expect too many raised eyebrows when I say single valued MZV. But for someone who uh, is not aware, this might sound a bit weird because how can a number possibly be single valued, right? Um, so to explain this a bit, we have to take a step back. Um, Sorry, there's oh, a question from Zoom, oh, sure. <laughs> uh, which is, is it actually the same Nielsen as in Penchel Nielsen coordinates? That's a good question that I do not know the answer to. <laughs> Does anybody? Do you have many coordinates? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm uh, sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, so we have to take take a step back to really understand this a bit better. Um, iterated integrals on a puncture sphere generically lead to generalized polylogarithms, which were some iterated integrals introduced by Gonsharov. And these are really the large family that contain all of your favorite logarithms. So at weight one, weight being the length of this vector here, it's just any logarithm. Uh, this also includes all the classical poly, uh, poly logarithms that were well known or studied uh, throughout history. And these functions form a shuffle algebra and a graded half algebra over the rational. So um, yeah, these are essentially ubiquitous functions that you see everywhere in perturbation theory, both in gauge theory and also in string theory in some sense. Um, and they're typically multi-valued functions with branch cuts. Of course, here the log is already a good example of something that has a branch cut. But you can uh, combine these polylogarithms into some specific combinations. So you use polylogarithms and their complex conjugates such that all the branch cuts cancel, essentially. So you have zero monogamous. Um, and this gives rise to a single-valued class of functions. Uh, so, so what you could do is you could pair to each polylogarithm a single-valued polylogarithm, GSV, which obeys the same holomorphic differential equation, the so same differential equation in Z. Um, but it has no branch cuts, which means you have to add something anti-homomorphic, essentially. This sounds a bit vague, but if you look at an example, it's immediately clear. So if we look at the weight one, the single valued log is just the log plus the complex conjugate log, which is the same as the log of the modulus squared. And since the modulus squared is positive definite, this never hits branch cuts. So clearly this, this object single valued. Uh, I also added a more spicy example here, which you can see is a bit more complicated, although really it's not that complicated because uh, most of these terms you can just understand using some um, uh, some games with these words, essentially, um, except for this term here, which is the really spicy term, the say the three containing term. So this is just to in, uh, illustrate that some of these single valued polylogs, if you want to construct them, you'll end up uh, generating some terms which have zeta value times something purely anti-holomorphic. And um, yeah. So then you can define a map, which you call the single valued map. And the single valued map acts by taking any polylog and sending it to its single valued analog. The map preserves the shuffle, preserves functional relations. It commutes with the holomorphic deriv derivative by definition because we wanted to preserve this. But of course, it does not commute with the anti-holomorphic derivative. I think that's painfully clear from these examples. But um, yeah, you can't have everything. Um, so now, OK, we have these single valued polylogarithms. But noting that the, the zeta values are actually related to the polylogs or that they're just evaluated polylogarithms, uh, it's natural to define these single valued multiple zeta values. So essentially, if you treat a zeta value as an evaluated function rather than a number, then we can call the single valued zeta values the uh, evaluated single valued function that corresponds to it. And some examples here. Uh, so the single valued zeta value of an even number is zero. Uh, single valued zeta value of an odd number is twice itself. And the multiple zeta values have some slightly more complicated behavior. But it's very easy to generate these relations. I mean, this is uh, understood. I mean, generating these single valued polylogs is understood algorithmically. It's a matter of uh, pressing a button on a computer and you generate a big set. However, there's more. I mean, so now I've just been talking about the periods that arise in principle. You could say, OK, well, it's nice that here you get some, some numbers and here you get the single valued versions of those numbers. But it turns out that um, the, uh, oh, yeah, that's, that's a good idea. 
yeah, there we go. Um, but it turns out that the single value map is more important uh, in this context than expected. Sorry, yeah. In particular, if we look at those token string integrals that I uh, talked about before, so here we have a token string integral at tree level for the open string, where we integrate over some cylinder boundary. Here we have this Coben Nielsen factor times a Park Taylor, uh, where this is the definition of the Park Taylor, so this is just a collection of simple poles. And for the closed string, we integrate over the punctured sphere, um, again with this Coben Nielsen factor, and we have an anti-holomorphic Park Taylor factor inserted as well. Well, if you actually study these integrals in depth, um, you can see that um, they are actually related through the single value map. I mean, if you expand this, this string integral order by order in alpha prime, from the open string, you can just get the closed string for free by applying the single value map, which is understood algorithmically. And a, and a key point to, uh, to proving this is uh, some sort of duality between these two highlighted objects here. So here we have the cylinder, uh, the disk boundary, sorry. Uh, and here we have this part Taylor factor. Now, of course, the disk boundary, its singular behavior is whenever two of these punctures collide. And for the Park Taylor, it's exactly the same. We just have simple poles and the differences between the positions of those punctures. So the Park Taylor is dual to the sun, to the disk boundary, um, and this is really a crucial ingredient in in showing this. This is um, kind of yeah, the, the the meat of the proof, let's say. So anyway, back to this table because I'm talking about tree level, but of course we want to go to one loop. Um, but uh, it turns out that this table, which I drew with this very uh, hard rigid line here in the middle really should be more of a membrane. Uh, there's like a single valued map that sends you from one to the other. And really, if you have all the information here you want, you can also generate all the information here. So this, these are communicating vessels in a way. And now the question arises, is, well, what about one loop, right? At one loop here, we would get elliptic multiple zeta values. There's some extension of the, zeta, uh, the multiple zeta values at genus one, zero. And here we get modular graph forms, which are some non-holomorphic modular forms associated to some graph. Um, and you could wonder, well, what should I put here? Is there some single valued map that also brings me from one to the other? Uh, and this is more or less the topic of my talk. So I, I wanna uh, approach the subject more or less from two different angles. Uh, and the first part is from the string intervals first. Right, so um, we want to study the, the string integrals on the cylinder and the torus. So first, let's look at their geometries a bit. So we can parameterize the cylinder as being a half torus. What that means is that we take some uh, tau, which we set to be imaginary, and then the punctures lie along this imaginary axis. We identify the two sides of the square here. Uh, and yeah, yeah, this obviously forms a cylinder. Um, for the torus, we can take a parallelogram, identify the opposite sides, and then the, the geometry of the torus is entirely fixed by this uh, one parameter, this one uh, complex number in the upper half plane, because we fix the other side to one. We fix one puncture to zero and the other punctures are free to roam inside of this parallelogram. So those are essentially the geometries that we're talking about. And as you can see, this tau makes an appearance in both. And the point is that we will not integrate out this tau. So everything we do will still have this tau dependence in there. Uh, that's a very crucial point to what I'll be talking about. Um, if we want to introduce some, uh, some integrals on these spaces, we should have some idea of what uh, a good basis of integrands is. So if you think about genus zero, there we had these polylogarithms. So we have simple poles that are really the crucial ingredients. Um, the extension of the polylogarithmic kernels to, to the genus one case to the torus are given by these F kernels, which are uh, which you get by expanding the W periodic quantity Eisenstein series. This is just a ratio of some Jacobi theta functions. And essentially you can, you can combine these W periodic Eisenstein series into this long chain adding in these auxiliary variables, these etas, which you use to expand to the different kernels. And if we insert many of these, essentially you can, you can more or less generate, uh, um, guarantee, I should say, say more or less because it's still conjectural, that you get some kind of generating function of integrands on the torus. So for, for n punctures, this far phi here will give you all the different combinations of F kernels you will typically um, encounter in string theory. But this is not the only way to, to arrange these um, Konecker Eisenstein series, you can also define metamorphic functions on the torus, VW, uh, by taking a chain of them and giving each of them the same auxiliary variable, this xi here. Then you get these VW functions. And if you take some specific linear combinations of those VW functions, those Vs actually mimic the polar structure of the Park Taylor factor, which, uh, if you recall, is a very important ingredient to the proof of this single valued map being crucial at genus zero. 
So that indicates that this is actually a, a good ingredient to look at when it comes to generating uh, integrands. Um, these Vs, yeah, mimic the polar structure of the Park-Taylor factor. And since the disk boundary and the cylinder boundary are not all that different, uh, this might be a very important point. Right, so then we can introduce those cylinder and torus integrals. Um, so the cylinder integral, uh, again, you integrate over the cylinder boundary. You have this var phi, so this full complete generating function of all the integrands times uh, the Kobe Nielsen factor. And uh, for the closed string, you integrate over the punctured torus with this anti-holomorphic V we introduced before, which is in some sense behaving in a way similar to this uh, cylinder boundary. And then uh, another generating function of, of full integrands on torus and the Kobe Nielsen factor again. So they, they're quite similar. It's a very similar setup to uh, the case at genus zero. And here I give the form of these uh, green functions, but they're not all that important in what I will talk about because uh, recall, I said we're not integrating out the modular parameter tau, and this is a crucial point because we don't we won't want to study these integrals as is. We don't we don't want to just jump in and study them like that. We actually want to look at their differential equations in tau. This is a, a very important point. Um, each of these generating series or each of these token string integrals that we just introduced have uh, quite elegant uh, differential equations in tau, where you have a sum over k. 1 minus k times tau to the k minus 2. You have the holomorphic Eisenstein series appearing here. And here you have um, matrices that are representations of Tsunagai's derivation algebra. So these are um, some n minus 1 factorial by n minus 1 factorial matrices. They're linear in SIJs, and they're essentially made up of eta's, differentials of eta's, and zeta values. Um, and to putting these two uh, uh, equations right above each other, it's immediately kind of uh, striking that they're so similar. In particular, if we highlight the differences, you can see really that um, these differential operators are extremely related. I mean, here we have tau to the k minus 2. Here we have tau minus tau bar to the k minus 2. Here we have the representation matrices of the Tsunagai algebra. And here we have their single-valued versions, where this is the single-valued map uh, of genus 0 that we introduced before, of polylogs. So essentially, well, we could say, OK, let's just uh, introduce a map which we call capital SV. Um, it's some extension of the single valued map. It's, it's in, incorporates the single valued map at genus zero for anything that's say the value values. Um, but it acts on tau, sending tau to tau minus tau bar. Uh, and it doesn't touch the holomorphic Eisenstein series. And if we, if we introduce this map, I mean, just postulating that it's, you know, that it's there and that it's somehow relevant, then this relates these two differential operators to each other. And I should say, I mean, this might look a bit funny, sending tau to tau minus tau bar uh, as a some sense single valued analog of tau. But in fact, when you think of it, uh, when you think of tau as a log of q in the q variable, then this would be the single valued log of q. So in some sense, this is a quite natural definition, even though it looks a bit funny in this language. Um, right, so, so we found these string integrals. We've um, shown their differential equations in tau. We've shown that the differential operators are related through this map that we just call sv. Um, suggestive naming, but we don't really know what this SV map means. But of course, we, we're just mapping between uh, differential operators. We still need initial values, right? I mean, if you want to actually solve something, you need to have some 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 boundary knowledge. Um, and again, these these metamorphic V functions end up being uh, coming to the rescue because they're they're actually engineered such that if you take the appropriate limits, uh, so the limit at the cusp, which is the uh, boundary value that we care about. They, they arrange themselves into some uh, linear combination of Park-Taylor factors. So those are the integrands that we saw at genus zero. And for those, it's well established that they're in some sense dual to this disk boundary or the cylinder boundary. So for them, actually, uh, it's quite obvious that this, this single value map in some sense should go through. I should say it's not obvious uh, for all factors of the, of the uh, boundary point because we care about the full Laurent polynomial. We don't just care about the value at the cusp, but we, we care about uh, contributions in log Q. So, so this isn't a proof by any means, but it is a good indication that in some sense, these, these metamorphic Vs naturally um, reflect this, this geometric property that if you take the torus and you take the limit of the cusp going to infinity, it's kind of like pinching one of the cycles, which is geometrically in some sense equivalent to the nodal sphere. So the sphere where you have two points identified. Um, right, so this is just, I mean, this hints at good behavior, but we still have to do something in practice, of course. This isn't, uh, this isn't enough. Uh, luckily, we can just compute at low orders in alpha prime and a to j, both of these generating series, and take the limits at the cusp. 
And um, this seems to work. I mean, if you take this, this uh, B, you take the limit at the cusp and you act on it with a single valued map of zeta values, you land on the result for the J. And um, I should mention, there's been previous work that also indicated this, that in some sense, these, these modular graph forms are like single valued analogs of, uh, of some G and zero object. So since this map capital S phi is defined such that it corresponds to this genus zero single valued map, so it kind of encapsulates it, this in turn implies that, well, these two functions must be related by it somehow, right? I mean, we're mapping differential operators to each other and we're mapping initial values. So there has to be something going on. Um, now, of course, this is still a very mysterious object. I mean, I just did a minimal tweak of the uh, genus zero single valued map and that's it. So we still don't know how this actually acts on the constituent functions on each side. And to do that, we can just take the differential equations and solve them using Picard iteration. If you do that, each of these uh, generating functions become combinations of iterated Eisenstein integrals. And here I chose a uh, slight reordering of the, the usual definition of iterated Eisenstein integrals, but that's because um, it aligns more closely with the definitions that we use. So these, uh, these objects are just iterated integrals over um, some holomorphic Eisensteins with some rational kernels in, uh, well, the integration variable and in the, uh, the um, tau. And uh, yeah, this, um, they essentially are made up of, of uh, or they're characterized by this J and K or words in J and K uh, at higher depths. K is uh, larger or equal than four and J is bounded between zero or K minus two. So these are the, the objects that we'll really be studying. And well, okay, we, we can solve both of these cases in terms of the iterated Eisenstein integrals. What would be more interesting is to just say, okay, well, we assume that this capital S phi map connects the J and the B. We solve both and we look term by term and identify what this map capital S phi acts on, like on with, uh, with these iterated Eisenstein integrals. And we, we assemble some combination of iterated Eisenstein integrals that, um, yeah, that's equal to the, to the SV image of, of uh, the original Eisenstein integral. Of course, since we're doing this from a uh, differential equation in tau, we can only fix it up to some anti-holomorphic integration constant kappa. So that's an important point. And also throughout this talk, I will be using y as the, um, the imaginary part of tau uh, normalized with some pi. Which, is, which carries the um, holomorphic Eisenstein series. Right, exactly. So, yes, thank you. Good question. Uh, <laughs> um, you can fix these kappas, um, but you have to use some other information. So, for instance, um, if you look at modular graph forms and you know how to, exp if you have some basis of modular graph forms and you know how to express them in terms of these beta SVs, 
uh, then you can use the reality properties of these modular graph forms to fix these kappas essentially. They have some fixed reality properties. Um, so you can proceed essentially case by case, although I should say at the step two case, we have a closed formula um, that's inferred by looking at a lot of data. But, but yeah, what I've presented so far in, this, in these slides does not suffice to fix these kappas. You need some extra ingredients. And in this case, it's coming from the fact that the modular graph form has a nice reality property. And so if you know how to write it in terms of some beta SVs, then you can, uh, you can infer the kappas from that, essentially. Yeah. Uh, right. So yes, so there were two ingredients at genus one, or two directions, let's say. First of all, a single valued map of polylogs, which was important connecting the periods. And there was a single valued map acting on string integrals, which coincided and were the same. And so far, I've shown you, OK, yeah, no worries. So far, I've shown you this SV map, which sends string integrals from the open to the closed string to each other. But we haven't really talked about what does this actually mean? I mean, does this have some interpretation in terms of the iterated Eisenstein integrals? And in particular, this is a very pressing question because there are you know, uh, well understood concepts that were introduced by Francis Brown of both modular and single valued iterated Eisenstein integrals. So I mean, this begs a question. I've been calling it capital S V, but I have never called it a single valued map yet <laughs> for a good reason, because we don't know how it relates to that yet. And that's how this, this second part of the talk really um, fits in. So we're going to try and build a dictionary between these beta SVs that naturally occur when you look at these string integrals and the, the construction by Francis Brown that's put in pure mathematics, essentially. And an important ingredient in this construction is the concept of equivariance. So if you have some uh, function which uh, acts on the upper half plane and sends you to some uh, combination of these uh, generating letters y and x uh, with rational prefactors times some uh, complex number, you can define an SL2z action, so some modular action on these generating letters, such that uh, if you act on x comma y with gamma, gamma being a, b, c, d, then you get a, x plus b, y, comma, c, x plus d, y. And then you call a function equivariant, function like this equivariant, if um, it's invariant under acting with the SL2 action on this, uh, these two letters, and also acting on the modular parameter. And for such an equivariant function, we can just expand. So if we expand uh, this object, which is given in terms of these x's and y's, in terms of these factors, x minus tau y, x minus tau bar y, then this, this prefactor here, f r comma s, is modular, and it has weights r comma s. So it behaves like this under the modular transformation. Now, this is a crucial ingredient because this allows us to really um, think, OK, well, if we find some equivariant function, some generating function that we can um, describe at least partly in terms of iterated Eisenstein integrals, then we can start building some modular forms that are related to these Eisenstein integrals. And that would lead us, that would essentially give us a bridge to connect to this work. So in particular, the depth one example that, uh, that Brown gives is uh, related to the real analytic Eisenstein series, which is defined by the sum here. So, so the full equivariant function is just the real analytic Eisenstein series times these factors that I talked about before. And we can rewrite the real analytic Eisenstein series in terms of our beta SV that we introduced before. Um, and so here, I mean, it seems like this combination, we could pull out some, this prefactor here uh, also in this term, and then we have some combination of a beta SV and some zeta value that has nice modular properties that behaves in a fixed way. Um, so why not do that? We can define something which we call beta equivariance in a slight abuse of notation, um, or in slight abuse of jargon, I should say. Um, which is the completion of some beta SV, which transforms as a modular form. And at depth one, essentially we get this combination. Where we have beta equivariance equals some beta SV minus this zeta value containing part, such that the, the real analytic Eisenstein series is proportional to exactly one beta equivariance. And this has a fixed modular behavior. Now, okay, this is depth one, not very interesting. We want to go to higher depth, of course. We want to study more functions. Luckily, um, also in the work of Brown, there is a depth two example of an equivariant function. So there's essentially some structure as to how to construct something like this. Um, and also luckily, there's uh, already a nice database of functions which are which have nice modular properties and have a beta SV representation from previous work on Poincaré series by three of the people here in this room. So essentially what you can do is you can look at the structure of this depth two equivariant function. You can look at these, uh, this database of Poincaré series and you can say, okay, well, this, this database of Poincaré series 
um, as this, these modular functions that have some beta as few representation should also be able to be rewritten in terms of some beta equivariance because this also has nice modular properties. And essentially from that, from this whole data set, you can infer the relation of these beta equivariants to, to the single value, or to the beta SVs, I should say, um, that we had before. And an important difference here is that at depth two, they contain some admixtures of lower depth. They're not just uh, tails of zeta values that you have to add with some powers of y, but you actually have to add some lower depth beta SVs as well. And if you go to higher depth, you get a similar structure. In fact, um, okay, no, this is still depth two, but we have some general formula for the behavior of this beta equivariance or a general expectation of the form that it's supposed to obey, uh, which we call the deconcatenation formula. So this beta equivariance equals beta SV at depth one plus just something, which is zeta containing. I mean, that's something that I already showed, but it's just in a different language. Uh, we call these factors the CSV. Uh, and at depth two, we have beta equivariance at uh, equals, at depth two equals uh, beta SV at depth two plus some mixture, mixed term of this CSV and the beta SV, which we saw here. Here are these middle terms, and then some depth two CSV, which is this, sorry, this tail right here. Um, there's this extra term as well, which is called uh, beta delta. And this essentially denotes contributions which can involve some integrals over uh, holomorphic cusp forms. From the point of view of this talk, they will not be important because in a minute I'm going to sweep them under the rug. Um, but you should know, you should be aware that in general, if you go to high enough values for these Ks here, they can appear and they will appear. And so they are important to take into account if you want to do a full analysis. Uh, yeah, and here I put some examples of these CSVs. Uh, so you can see they're just uh, essentially zeta values, uh, single light zeta values with some uh, refactors. Right, so, okay, now um, I, I mentioned I want to sweep these uh, deltas under the rug. So let me uh, do that I, now. I, I am sorry, are these are these big, big form? Uh, sorry, I couldn't understand that. Constraints? Are these big constraints that appeared on the previous slide anyhow connected with values of zeta function at even integers? Uh, sorry, like which? this 907,200, uh, 907, is it like, I don't know, zeta of 10 divided by p to the power of 10 or something like that? Or, That's or I, I, I don't know, I, I'm very bad. I'm very bad on this, I'm sorry, but like just asking. Uh, sure. I mean, as far as I know, these numbers uh, don't seem to have any nice, uh, uh, or at least we haven't gone into depth onto uh, where these numbers are exactly coming from, I think. Um, I don't think we've, we've analyzed any generic structure of these numbers. So for now, they're just experimentally determined by looking at a large data set, essentially. Um, but yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Um, right, so I want to sweep under the rug these, these holomorphic cusp forms. Um, and I can do that by assembling these beta equivariants into a gen generating series. So I can take uh, something I call J equivariants. Um, and this is just a sum over some prefactor times the appropriate beta equivariant with J and K, sum over uh, J and K's full um, range times these epsilons again. So these epsilons make a reappearance. They're again, the generators of Tsunagai's derivation algebra, which pops up everywhere in this genus one story. Um, we assemble the, so these are, this is depth zero, this is depth one, you can go to higher depth, this is the, essentially the all depth term that you have to multiply some beta equivariance with the same word. Um, and th the value of these epsilons really, I should say, is that they obey relations which automatically cancel out all the terms containing these holomorphic cusp forms. So once you do this, uh, this assembly into a generating series, you don't have to worry about these contributions anymore. You, you naturally, this orange box here can essentially be ignored. And so if we look at this deconcatenation formula again, so the beta equivariant equals this cusp containing part plus um, DSV times BSV, where DSV are these typical combinations of CSVs that appeared before. Then we can write this uh, J equivariant, this generating series in terms of a generating series of beta SV times this DSV, which is a generating series of this DSV. So here, this the orange box has, has essentially disappeared. We don't have to care about it anymore. Once we um, yeah, implement the Tsunagai uh, relations, that appear here in these generating series, essentially. Right, so now we have a form for this um, generating series at arbitrary depth. Um, but I didn't just uh, uh, introduce this machinery to, uh, to get rid of the holomorphic cusp forms. There's another reason, which is that uh, in the original construction by Brown, there is an alternative way that you don't always have to go through an equivariant generating function in this X and Y. There's also a construction immediately in terms of a generating series 
of these epsilons. So, so Brown also has an equation for this J equivariance. And now, of course, what we could do is we could compare our construction to Brown's construction, look at the different ingredients that appear, and compare them. So Brown's, Brown's construction is given here at the top. It has a lot of ingredients, but I will one by one kind of go through them. Um, so uh, the, the, the most basic parts of this construction essentially are this uh, J plus and J minus, which are essentially generating functions of uh, iterated integrals over Eisenstein series. Um, I should mention this tilde here means word reversal in the epsilon. So there the, these, uh, this epsilon word has been reversed. And this beta plus and beta minus notation essentially means just iterated integrals which only involve these omega pluses or omega minuses. Um, so these are the, the forms of omega plus and omega minus. And if you recall, beta SV at F2 had uh, this term which was mixed, right? Had both omega plus and omega minus. And so these are these are like uh, the different constituents that you get in a beta SV. You can write the beta SV as some combination of these beta plus and beta minus plus the anti-holomorphic um, integration constants that we still have to fix. And so at depth one, essentially, you just get beta SV is given by the sum of a beta plus and a beta minus. Right. The next ingredient, which is uh, more interesting, is the series BSV in the middle. And the series BSV, again, is it's a generating series in these epsilons, uh, which is determined by these constants BSV. And in, uh, in the original construction by Brown, these are fixed by studying some multiple modular values. But by comparing to our construction, to the CSVs that we had defined before in the deconcatenation formula, we can give them an explicit form in terms of these CSVs. So assuming that our equivariant generating function that we you know, constructed heuristically essentially by looking at this data set uh, matches what, what uh, Brown constructed, then we have these BSVs in terms of the CSVs now. And an interesting point, which will become more important later, about these BSVs is that they have some explicit tau bar dependence. They're not just given in terms of zeta values and y's, but they have some uh, tau bar baked in. So for example, at depth one, it coincides exactly with, um, with the DSV as before, but um, at higher depth, you can see here, there are some terms which have explicit tau bars, and these will become very important later on. Right, the, there's another ingredient which is given by this map phi SV, um, and this phi SV, we can relate to derivation actions ZM on Sunagai's algebra. So you can define some uh, ZM, which is derivation on this epsilon algebra. And um, from the properties of this algebra, you know that these brackets of Z with epsilons have to be able to be written in terms of um, nested brackets of only epsilons. So essentially what these Zs do, if you hit it with some words, if you hit some word in epsilon with this Z, uh, with a commutator, it's going to essentially shuffle this around. If you, 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 you act on the Z uh, on an epsilon with this Z and it's going to generate a whole bunch of terms which create some uh, yeah, mixture in this generating series essentially. Um, and so we, what we've seen by comparing to our construction is that we can, we can give an alternative form for this map phi SV um, by saying, okay, phi SV equals the original um, element that you started from um plus two times a zeta value times a bracket with the z plus two times two zeta values two brackets with the z etc and um once you have these these um relations under control again this is fully constructive i mean this is a matter of constructing a database of these relations which can be done algorithmically because these epsilons and these z's both have representations in terms of some free lie algebra of two generators so once you plug that in you can start generating these relations from some uh, generic ansatz uh, from some uh, using just some, yeah, some machinery on, on working on this freely algebra. So, so also these commutators in principle are fully under control. So this is also a constructive definition. You could, yeah, you could generate a big uh, data set from this. And now um, a major point, which uh, maybe is what we've been building up to this whole time, is I was saying, well, we want to define some uh, modular iterated Eisenstein integrals to build this map with Francis Brown's construction here in particular. Um, but in, but uh, a more important part is that actually this allows us to peek a glimpse at these single value iterated Eisenstein integrals, which in Francis construction are given by the J equivariance times BSV inverse. And so once you have uh, the J equivariance and the BSV, you can compute this in principle. But uh, we don't even have to go through those lengths. What we can just do is we can insert our um, 
our experimental, let's say, uh, definition of this J equivariance in terms of the deconcatenation formula in here. And then immediately you see that our betas, uh, beta SVs are not the, uh, the different coefficients of this JSV generating series. They can't be because you have this DSV times BSV inverse. And they, I mean, the, these two generating series are not equal. Um, if you recall, oh, sorry. These BSVs had some explicit tau bar dependence. In fact, if you take the BSV and you truncate this sum at zero, so you don't sum over this L, then you get exactly the, the DSVs. So there is some mismatch between these BSVs and the DSVs. And this mis mismatch will mean that, um, that these two series cannot be uh, related very clearly or very immediately. So since the, this factor is not equal to one, the beta SVs don't coincide with Brown's single valued iterated Eisenstein integrals, even though we've been calling them beta SV. They're not exactly the coefficients of the series. But you can view them as T invariantized versions because actually the coefficients of this series um, are not T invariant. And as I mentioned before, our beta SV is. You can actually see it manifestly by the properties of DSV. I mean, J equivariant has to be equivariant. Um, DSV is T invariant, so this must also be T invariant, whereas BSV is not T invariant because of this extra tau bar dependence, essentially. Right. Um, that brings me to my conclusions. So essentially, what I've tried to do with this talk is bridge the gap between two papers which look at the similar problem in, from very different angles. Um, in particular, the string first approach where we identified some mapping which sends open string integrals to closed string counterparts just by staring at some differential equations, essentially. Um, and this inferred some iterated Eisenstein integrals beta SV, which have been very useful as building blocks of modular graph forms. So they're, um, they've proved their use already uh, in the physics literature. Um, but there was still the question uh, relating to genus zero, whether these are as immediately related to the single valued map as they are in the genus zero case. And it turns out um, that this, pro this problem can be, or this question can be answered by essentially generating an extension beta equivariant of these iterated integrals, which have some definite modular properties. And these beta equivariants are like a bridge between these beta SV objects and the work on modular and single valued iterated Eisenstein integrals by Brown. And we see that the beta SVs do not correspond to the single valued iterated Eisenstein integrals of Brown, but there are modifications there essentially. Um, but the beta equivariance should be, so um, yes. So this kind of closes this story in a bit of a convoluted way. Um, but it seems that the, the story at genus one is less uh, immediately clear cut than the, the story at genus zero, where this mathematical single valued map immediately proved its use for the string integrals. And here, um, it seems these two concepts are a bit more disjoint. All right, now the question of course, um, what can we do next? And uh, an immediate first point that you could think of is, well, I've been talking about modular graph forms. Well, I've been talking about beta SV, but essentially they're similar concepts. Um, so you could say, okay, let's, let's not integrate over the last puncture. And then you get something called elliptic modular graph forms, which will have some explicit dependence on this set. And they should morally be much closer to the polylogarithms that the single valued map was uh, originally defined for. So in some sense, this is like a natural extension. I mean, it's kind of like we've been looking at the single valued map of MZVs this whole talk, whereas really the single valued map is much clearer when you look at it from a polylog point of view. So maybe this could also teach us something. Um, so there's been a lot of work on this modular graph forms. They've appeared in many papers on string theory. Um, there are Z-dependent versions of these beta SVs. They have been studied. Um, this is a paper that will appear soon. <laughs> uh, and also, Mike Dan Hitting will give a talk later this workshop where he explains the properties of these beta SVs, which are analogous uh, functions, but have some explicit set dependence uh, in more detail. And, and these beta SVs with, with set dependence are also extensions of already existing constructions for single valued elliptic polylogarithms to, to Zagier. So maybe you know, going to an unintegrated puncture will make the story even more clear cut um, because that's in practice is also how the story becomes most clear um, for genus zero. And then of course, um, Yes, maybe an obligatory uh, point in any Outlook talk about any perturbation theory, uh, we could go to next genus and see what happens. All right, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bram. Questions? Maybe a very late one. 
in the latent uh, uh, forces bound function and yours, uh, there was a Y theory. Is it just due to the weight and because you have a normalization by Y, or one of them is not actually automorphic and you have to complete it to get something automorphic? Sorry, you mean uh, here? Uh, no, just before when you were giving the example, uh, the relation between the two, uh, the SV yeah. and the equivariant, right? There is this style yes. that depends on Y explicitly. Yes. I was just wondering if this Y behavior is because of your normalization or if it's really something which is not automorphic and you have to... It's want... necessary to get something equivariant. I mean, these data SVs are not well behaved under modular transformation. They, they're not invariants under S transformation. So they don't have nice modular properties. They also don't behave as modular forms in and of themselves. So you need to give them this tail of Ys in order for them to be coefficients of an equivariant. Well, the equivariant are. Sorry? There is one side that is... Uh, so this side is equivariant, and, and this side is not. Well, okay. okay. This, together they are, but individually they're not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, because of the equality, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. More questions? Anybody on Zoom? No? Can I ask a question? I can report that I used a short moment to look up the Nielsen question, and there are different Nielsens. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the answer to Xenia, but it was the last question at the beginning. So if there's nothing else, um, let's thank Bram again. And um, depending on which program you looked at, you might uh, have different information. So the correct information is we start again at 1.30 with a talk by Sunil Muki. See you then.